All right, and just to let everybody know, this will be recorded. Um, so you may see a little pop-up that just came up saying that it will be recorded and this will be sent out to anybody who cannot attend and probably to everybody that uh, is on the Canaxis email list as well. So I'll give it another minute and then we're going to start. Um, just a brief introduction of who I am so uh, we can start with the webinar. My name is Kayla Lambie and I am the curriculum developer here at Hatch. So I do a lot of project creation. Um, I work with creating lesson plans for teachers who also use the platform. We have a variety of schools around uh, Canada and the US that all use our platform to help teach computer science. Um, and that's kind of the role that I have. I also work with coaches to make sure that they're delivering the material correctly and that they can help the students in the best way possible. Um, I'm an OCT certified teacher and I am also a curriculum developer by trade and I have my master's in curriculum development. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go through a brief PowerPoint that kind of explains some of the basics of Hatch and then we are going to um, do a few regular questions and then I'll open up the floor to anybody that has any specific questions. Okay. Just gonna make sure that I can put this over here so I can invite anybody that is coming in. Beautiful. Can everybody see my screen? If you can put a yes in the chat or somebody say yes, that would be great. Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Can everybody still see it? Nice and big now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So if I stop every now and then, I'm just letting in a few more people. So this is at home coding. When you come in, if you can mute yourself, that would be amazing. So just a brief outline for the presentation. So we're gonna go over what is Hatchet Home or the Hatch Studio. Uh, we're going to walk you through the student account, the parent account, the skills that are going to be gleaned from using Hatch at Home and the certification process, and also student progress and how much students should be completing each day or week. So what is Hatch at Home? So the first thing is Hatch is fully online learning. Kids learn to read and write code uh, using full coding language with syntax. So this is different from a lot of the other um, coding platforms that are directed at younger age groups where they use block coding. We also use a mastery-based learning approach where we believe that the more you do something and the more you practice, the better you become at it. And this practice allows you to move forward. Also, we believe in project-based learning. Project-based learning is completing projects and activities to allow your learning rather than kind of prescriptive education. This is a um, progressive teaching methodology and it's one that I personally have studied in detail in my academic career. Uh, we also give descriptive feedback on assignments and projects completed. So every single time a student submits one of their project, a real human coach will um, give them feedback on the assignments that they complete. And finally, we also develop a variety of computer science skills. So some of the computer science skills that we focus on are requirements-based programming. This includes practice and creativity, programmatic research, which is learning to find out solutions on your own. This is a really important skill for programmers and people generally is learning how to research and read um, documentation. We also have computational thinking, which is how to break down large ideas into smaller sections. These are things like abstraction um, and design. We also have communication and code talk, which is working with peers and also ensuring that students have great communication, both in their coding style and in their um, skills talking to other programmers. This is one of the key reasons why we started the uh, team events and we think that this is going really, really well. 
So in Canaxis, um, they have set you all up with a dedicated team level membership. So you get all the casual level perks as well as a weekly meeting with a coach. And this is great to help kids progress and motivate them to code and have fun in teams. So some of the features uh, that I've already mentioned is you get all of that descriptive feedback on every single project you complete. You have access to our full project library, which is 600 projects and about thousands of challenges. We also have a variety of showcases, which are larger projects that kids can complete on kind of their own time. They don't have as much direction, so kids can be a lot more creative. Uh, we also have the weekly check-in meeting, which is 15 minutes, and this helps students progress, answer any of their questions, and make sure that they're developing their soft skills. We also have an explanation on specific concepts that allows students to um, fully reach their potential in all ranges of skills. And students also have a one hour team meeting with four to six students who all code together. And finally, we um, have them completing Dragon Quest, which focus on key skills. And they build those skills over time as they complete the projects on the platform and the team events. So meeting with a coach, all meetings will take place on the Zoom platform. And you're gonna receive an invite to these meetings. You can check your online calendar and your meeting or an email for your meeting login and information. Um, these will be sent through Jihad, who is at um, Hatch Coding Support. So if you have any issues regarding your meeting times or setting that up, uh, support at Hatch Coding will be able to help you there. And your meeting code should look something like this. And just like you join this meeting, this is exactly how um, students join their meetings. And you can join via the Zoom app, the phone, or a browser. And if you're having any troubles, uh, you can always email your coach directly, who will be on the invitation on your calendar. And they're gonna help you with all of that, especially if you're having trouble logging in during that time. So what is the Hatch Studio? Um, this is actually where students learn how to code using Hatch. So you can see a little bit of the project library above. Uh, when students start out, we have what we like to call the new student experience, which helps guide students at the very early levels to make sure that they're progressing properly and that it's nice and simple when they start. What we realized originally was students were having a little bit of trouble starting right away. So we've tried to break it down into clear steps so that students can move forward in an easy, straightforward way. Once they've reached the point where we think that um, they'll be able to kind of interact with the program fully, they have access to our project library. Some projects will be level locked, um, but they have access to all of the projects once they are a high enough level. So there are over 600 projects and thousands of challenges. And there are 26 learning levels that move students to greater independence through uh, requirements-based programming. So each one of the project teaches a skill or teaches a specific idea, in addition to allowing students to practice and to discover new ideas and fun things. So we always focus on projects being fun or teaching skills or both um, to make sure that students are learning. And we're always adding more challenges uh, to the projects as well. There are also showcases, which I briefly mentioned, and these are harder projects where students can really show off their creativity. Students can choose from different ideas like games, art, and real world situations. So students get to choose what they wanna finish and we're moving forward with the scaffolding process for showcases as well, so that students at lower levels can complete showcases a little bit easier. So we are, I'm gonna also walk you through the student account. So these are the key elements in the student account. So we've got the dashboard, which is where the students can see their hatch levels. We've got the project library, which includes all of the possible activities and projects that they can complete. Each one of those has a different difficulty level, which I will go over in a bit. Some challenges, you can also click on the project menu. We've got feedback from a real coach, as I've said. Uh, highlighted text, which allows the students to instantly see an explanation from the research manual. A research button, which allows the students to do a little bit of research on their own using hatch sourced um, reference materials or other reference materials. And the biggest resource that we use is the Hatch, hatch Reference Manual, which uh, includes all of the concepts explained in a kid-friendly way. So the student dashboard is basically where you see your progress. So you can get project points, challenge points, figure out what level of component they need to complete. So this means kind of the difficulty of the project and also the um, star level required. And this is generally to make sure that your student is progressing. 
So if you want to make sure that they're moving forward, you can check their level. Um, in the beginning, it's pretty easy to move forward one level a week um, or every two weeks. But as you go up in level, it becomes more and more difficult uh, because you have to complete more projects. And students can check this on their dashboard and parents can also check out this. So the project library is where they pick their students and how they learn to read and write codes, as I mentioned before. Some are level locked, um, so you may need to get a student to a bit of a higher level to access every single project. This was done to make sure that students don't pick projects that are too long and too difficult and get discouraged. So we want to make sure that scaffolding and moving forward is easy and accessible for all students. This is what a project card looks like and the functionality. So the front of the card shows a picture of the project and the name. So you may see a little text bubble at the bottom and that means that your you have feedback on this project from a coach and on the back has the name, a short description, and the length. So components are how many parts it has. High component projects, as I mentioned, are level locked and challenges are how many challenges that they have completed. And that's in the bottom right hand corner of the card. So the three difficulty levels that we have are English description, pseudocode, and type what you see. So English description is a difficult level which students will not start out. So if they just click on a new, new project after they leave the student experience, they may not be able to finish a project and we don't think that they're expected to. Over time, what they'll get is pseudocode. So they'll break it down to the first level where they start to learn about syntax and start to learn about the keywords associated, but they don't actually have every single um, word written for them. And finally, we have type what you see, which is literally where the students type what they see onto the screen into the coding area. This teaches fine motor skills relating to coding and is really important for younger students and also builds the recognition for um, a variety of different skills as they move forward. So this is kind of the look of each of the different levels. So English description is just a sentence. Pseudocode actually breaks it down, identifying the keywords used in um, code blocks. And finally, the type what you see is literally just what the students are expected to type in. So challenges, most projects do have three challenges. And one of the most important things for parents to know is students will not always be able to complete all of the challenges right away. Oftentimes they should come back to harder challenges when they've learned more skills by completing projects and easy challenges. Um, every one of your students will have a coach. And one of the best ways to move forward with that is if there's a challenge that they want help with, you can always ask a coach to give some project recommendations or help them out with those challenges. So this is kind of uh, the way a challenge looks and all of the different components. I'm not going to go over this too in depth, but we have the title, how many points it's worth, and how to mark it as finished, and the description. Sometimes there are hints which allow the, um, the user to figure out things a little bit easier. Usually projects that are at a lower level have better, more direct hints and higher level projects have slightly more vague hints so that over time students develop those um, soft skills and figure out how to change their own code naturally. So whenever students need help on a challenge, these are the kind of five steps I like to follow. So first check out the code in the base project. There are often hints there. Check out the research section, including the Hatch reference manual. Check the hints for each one of the, um, the challenge that you're working on. Complete more projects to learn more skills. And then finally, ask a coach with the help button, which has a little uh, pink look to it. And it says, I need help. So students can always reach out to a coach directly uh, at any time. And the coach will respond with written feedback um, within 24 hours. So this is something that's available on all projects and should be easy to access. So the other thing to note is that some challenges may be too difficult or involve co code that students don't know. And sometimes you do just need to continue doing more projects and learning more, more skills or asking for recommendations like I previously mentioned. So the project menu is where students can see kind of whether or not they finish something and how many points they get and a few additional sections. I'm just gonna briefly go through this. So we have the total project points earned, uh, this section on number two clicks to go to more challenges. So if they want to go back to the project, they click there. Three and four send them for project suggestions or back to their dashboard. And finally, if they'd like to take a screenshot of their project to save, then they can do that. That will show up on their student um, project library. 
Finally, we have feedback and feedback is given on each of the projects for students and students may get multiple feedbacks on a project. So a lot of the time a student will submit the project, get feedback from the coach, and then they will submit a challenge and then get feedback on that. If a student submits all at once, they will likely respond to the last kind of project that they did rather than every single one. Um, and if students ever have any questions, all of the feedback given from the I need help button can also be found in those little areas at the bottom that has the feedback shown on the project card. And there's also the feedback chart. So if you go to your results section, you can see a section that says feedback and it will write sorry it will include all of the feedback given from coaches so you can actually see all of the work that they've done and how they could improve or how they could move forward on their projects highlighted text allows a block to come up that explains some of the text so if you see something that looks like this the student can click on the yellow text and then they will have additional information helping them figure out how and what the functionality of this code is Finally, our, we have the research button and this links to a variety of different resources that are useful for students. The most used one is the Hatch reference manual, but we also have the Hatch image library. We have the processing JS documentation, Khan Academy, Stock Overflow, and Google. All of these are really important to help students move forward with their research skills and can be used depending on how the coach and the student likes to use them. But the most important one is the Hatch reference manual. Uh, the getting started guide can be found uh, in the student dashboard and this helps you get started and walks you through the platform it gives you instructions regarding logging in and starting to get coding so if you have any very very specific problems it's great to look there and it also gives you a video walkthrough of completing the first project which is foldable you can also find that on the new student experience walkthrough so the reference manual as i mentioned before is student friendly each page is clickable and we have over 100 pages to teach almost every concept that's found within Hatch and if they're looking for a specific keyword or concept you can press Control F to help. Some concepts do have more than one page for example objects and object-oriented programming is a little bit of a harder topic so we have several pages to help explain that. Uh, this is what the parent account looks like and this is all of the important sections that you'll need to know so Whenever you see one of your students, you'll be able to look at their subscription level and any other important information about your student, including their hatch level, and you can press the report to go directly to their skill report. Um, these are each of the buttons and they allow you to have access to the getting started guide, managing your account or payment settings. For checking your child's progress, you can press the four buttons above. So the first one shows all the projects, the second shows the feedback chart. The fourth shows your login information. So if, a if your child ever forgets their password or username, you can go in there. Um, the fourth is the account level, which you don't really have to worry about. And five is their actual hatch level. And finally, their skills report, which measures all of their soft skills. And these are assessed individually by the coach. These eventually will lead to a certification. Um, that students can achieve and a little additional project. So these are some of the hard and soft skills that are gleaned from working through this. So coders need to know hard and soft skills. Um, and we personally at Hatch feel like this is very, very important. So hard coding skills that they learn are JavaScript and Python. They learn concepts like variables, functions, reserved keywords, arrays, loops, conditionals, object-oriented programming, and a lot of other concepts as well. And I mentioned some of these soft computer skills previously, like requirements-based programming, programmatic research, computational logic, thinking, and communication. So the core competencies of programming, and at Hatch we really believe that programmers need more than just coding skills, and we wanna facilitate well-rounded programmers that fully understand how to engage in the economy of the 21st century. So students can earn a Hatch certification by leveling up their core competencies and their Hatch level. And finally, students are assessed on their core competencies during their checkup with a coach. So how much should your child do? This is a really common question that I personally get from parents. And there's no specific easy answer to this. It really depends on the age and motivation of the child. So to progress, a good minimum is one project a week with at least one challenge. But during the summer, if they don't have too much to do, I always recommend doing a project a day. Uh, projects can range from about 
five minutes to an hour, depending on the student's level and their ability to code. Um, it also depends whether they're doing it at type what you see or English description. But if you have a lot of time during the summer, one project a day is really nice and easy for kids to do. And if there's a little less time, a project a week with a challenge will still make them progress. But kids can do as much as they want. Here are some general hints for parents um, to help with their kids and get them started coding. One of the best things is to set aside coding time each week or day. So you can put a time saying during this time, I'd like you to do some coding. Set a minimum of amount of projects or challenges to complete. Your coach can also help with this. So we have um, lesson plans specifically catered for all of the parents for children. And what happens is the coaches will give recommendations for how many projects they should complete and also how many challenges and the project recommendations for improving their skills generally. We like students to be able to pick whatever projects they want. Um, so these are just recommendations. They're not mandatory. And we always believe that students should move forward at the pace they want. The next thing is allow students to complete the check-ins by themselves. Oops. Allow students to complete the check-ins by themselves. There we go. Uh, because a lot of the time parents want to help their kids a little bit too much and that sometimes takes away from their autonomy of doing the the sections by themselves so with very very young kids of course sit in for the first couple meetings but you don't have to be there all the time and a lot of the time the student can work on their own you do not have to be there to help them even when they're coding by themselves the next thing is let students struggle sometimes they need time to figure things out and this is one of the core ideas of progressive education is giving the students time to really understand and internalize the concepts that they're doing. It's not about getting it right away, it's about really learning it and understanding it. And if they get stuck, they can always complete a project at Type What You See, or just move on to another project if they're getting stuck on a challenge. Younger students sometimes have, have trouble coding and may need to learn how to type first, and you can check out typing.com to help with typing skills. So the next part is how can I check if they're learning? So sometimes parents wonder about if they're progressing. So you can always check out the amount of projects that they're completing and the level, check out the challenges they complete, check out the code for each project, look over their hatch level and see if they're improving. And finally, check out their core competency levels in the skills report. And one of the other big questions that parents ask is sometimes they think that students need to be told information, but we think that students learn best through explore, exploration and ha hands-on activity. So as students complete projects, they learn and play with new keywords. And over time, they develop their own understanding of these words and how they function. And this allows them to use them in a variety of different contexts, not just the original context that they've used them in. So they learn something like a draw function and eventually we'll be able to see how to use that in different situations. Students figure out that they get more points if they complete projects at higher levels and eventually that motivates them to work at pseudocode or to work at English description. They learn harder challenges and give more points but require more time and effort. So usually what happens is when a kid is starting out, they'll do type what they see, realize that they get three times the points for doing it at pseudocode and they get 10 times the points for completing it at English description. So this motivates them to be creative and to not use the type what you see or the pseudocode. Uh, I've got a few additional questions that I would like to mention prior to moving on. Um, and the first one is you need to know that your login will be in your email. So after you register, you should have an email key that will allow you to log into the platform and students can start to code right away as soon as they get this. So you're gonna be sent an email uh, with your scheduling link and you need to book it with your child's name and put the email address that they want to be invited onto it. And this will be for their first meeting and then you're gonna receive another invitation for your reoccurring meeting. So we have our introduction meeting and then that will be turned into a reoccurring meeting after the first meeting has happened. Um, so regarding team meetings, only students in level two or about to finish level one will receive their team meeting link um, and they will have to provide their availability. So we try to have all students picked at approximately the same level and to put them in time groups that work well for the parents and the students. So that will be sent to you after you reach about level two. 
If you need any specific help regarding this, please email support at hatchcoding.com for help with scheduling and getting your one on one started. And as I mentioned before, this is all recorded and will be sent directly to you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the floor for anybody that may have any questions um, regarding this. Okay. Hi, Kayla. Uh, this is Brad. Uh, first, thanks a lot. This uh, looks really cool. Perfect. Um, so just to get a sense, so it, it seems as though I guess the kids at the start will be doing a bunch of individual projects just to kind of ramp up uh, their knowledge. And then once they reach a certain level, at some point, they'll kind of be in a group. And are they working on a group project at that point? Or how is that working? Yes. So there's going to be two meetings with a coach that all of your students will have. So you're going to have a one on one. So it's going to be one coach to one student and they're going to kind of learn their basic skills there. And you're also going to have a meeting with four to six students and they're all going to code together. So they're going to start their kind of coding process individually so that they learn a few basic skills and learn how the platform works. And then they're going to be put into groups where they all code together at the same time. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks. Awesome. Hi, um, I'm me. I'm a little, I have a <laughs> maybe silly question, but here, so uh, from the website, we mentioned every day uh, we have one hour kind of a classroom. Yeah. So from three to four. So uh, that means that um, I, 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 I'm a little bit confused. So that means that the, the kids sign in with, yeah. with, with a parent account or they're going to get their, their account? So we have a daily webinar, um, Monday to Friday. And what that yeah. is, is all of the students that want to come all kind of join this big session together. So the sessions can have from 20 to 50 students all kind of going through and learning concepts together. Thursdays is the introductory session. So we have one session that focuses on introductory concepts, like learning how to draw shapes. And then the other days are all a little bit higher level, but students of all ages and all levels can join these. Um, they're provided to all students. So all you have to do is sign up for the webinar link. You can also reach out to support at Hatch Coding to get the link directly. And then your child will basically join the webinar just like we're doing here. Um, but there's going to be a coach helping them through problems. So her name is Brenda and she teaches the webinar every single day from three to 4 p.m. So this is in addition to the meetings that you have with your coach. And this is kind of separate from that, but it's something that we want to give to all Hatch people so that they can learn on their own. Okay, that's uh, the webinar is kind of a class, though the, uh, they, they teach something on the webinar so kids can learn. Yes, so the okay. kids, um, Usually what happens in the webinar is there's a variety of different things that happen based on the day and what the kids want. So it's always catered to the kids in the webinar. So they'll learn projects, they'll go through kind of a project or a hard challenge, they'll do some quizzes sometimes on fun coding concepts. It's all engaging and meant to be fun for kids while teaching them coding concepts and interacting with other kids. Because we also believe in community here at Hatch and we really want to emphasize that all students can learn together and have fun together. Okay, so that one not means that the teacher will assign homework to every kid. So in this week, you need to finish this. The project actually depends on kids. They pick up what they want to do, then they do it. Then the parent need to, um, you know, look at what they are doing then to provide some uh, suggestion, something mm -hmm. like that. Or coach will do do this type of things, kind of teacher to assign them something. So, okay, I will check next week. You need to finish at least uh, this two projects this week. It, which, which style we, we have here? So what we actually do is kids get to choose everything. Kids choose what they start. So you don't have to do it and the coach doesn't have to do it, but they will recommend projects. So we believe that kids will learn if they're given the opportunity to do any of the projects that they find interesting. Over time, they'll want to do more things and the more projects that they complete and they're exposed to, the more information they'll learn. So there's no kind of classical, I teach you this and you learn this. The students just continually practice and do the projects and they will learn through that method. This is again, more of a progressive teaching method. So it's a little more student focused, 
rather than parents or coaches telling everybody the information and telling them how to move forward. Does that make sense? So you as a parent don't really have to do much. You just have to make sure that they have some time to code and that they are coding. Their coach will give them any recommendations in terms of um, skills and developing their coding skills generally. But um, so you don't have too much of a role as a parent if you don't want. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, it sounds good. And uh, all the webinars, the links, so far I haven't got anything. So that means that a student's account or something, I'm going, I, I will get some more information before the, the class actually started, right? Yes, so okay. the webinars, um, what I'll do is I'll pull up the webinar link right now and I'll put that in the chat. Um, give me one moment. But the webinar is a little bit different compared to the classes. You're going to be sent emails regarding starting your classes. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get two invitations, one for your one on one and one for your group meeting. Um, I don't actually have the webinar link on me right now, but I will make sure that that gets sent out in the email that um, is sent out following this. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, somebody did send in the chat that they were wondering if kids need to know how to code previously and no. So the expectation is that the kids have absolutely no coding experience. The only requirement is that they have to be able to type. So sometimes it's a little bit difficult for students to type um, and especially do things like creating a semicolon. So besides that, everything needed is scaffolded on the platform. And as the students go through, at the beginning, it, it might seem a little bit uh, simple, like all they have to do is copy code from one place to another. But as I mentioned before, it's all about learning muscle memory and I, seeing the code that's actually coming up to life. So they see everything in the other side. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I just have a few questions to ask. Um, so one of my daughters, uh, her age is um, six and a half. So she will be seven in December. So can she also sign up a class? Because Meg Megan, our HRVP, only indicates from age of eight to 18. So, but I think one of two, one of two your slides says um, the age could be from six to older. Yeah, so generally what we recommend is that they can type and that's the big kind of barrier for kids under the age of eight. So I always say that if you have a child who's very proficient on the keyboard and they can successfully make a semicolon and they're able to look at the computer and kind of reflect, they're more than welcome to sign up. But okay. the issue is you may have to help them with their typing skills if they can't successfully use the computer. So there's a lot of making brackets and for a lot of young kids, they don't really have the fine motor skills in their hands to be able to press the shift button and then press the bracket button or to press the semicolon button. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And that website typing.com is certainly is very helpful. Um, some follow up questions. So the daily webinar, uh, cause the school is about to start from mid August. So, they obviously need to be in school during the daytime, how they can sign up for the daily webinar. So the daily webinar likely will change um, in the fall. So this has been starting from the summer. So we wanted to have it around 3 p.m. Um, but the again, the daily webinar is not something specifically for just a one on one. This is for all students. So likely we will be moving the webinar. But for the next um, month or so, it will be from three to four. Eastern time? Uh, yes. Okay. So we're based out of Toronto. Okay. It's good to know. And do you have any suggestion? Because my kids uh, haven't, um, they don't participate in these kind of classes before. So this is going to be their first time. And if they, you know, as a young kids, they might just try, try things out and a few sessions, they might get, get tired or feel not interested. So as a parent, do you have any suggestion how do we encourage or, or sense the time they really don't feel interested and they should put a stop rather than keep pushing it? So one of the things that I always recommend is asking the kids to do the projects that look fun. 
So if a child likes something like cats or, you know, likes drawing, a lot of our projects connect to those ideas. We also have things involving Minecraft and a variety of um, kind of student focused projects so that they'll engage in that way. So the idea is to engage with the things that they can do and the fun things that they can create. So Basic Painter is another one that kids seem to love because they create, uh, do you know Microsoft Paint? Yes. So they can basically create a version of that from all their first day of coding. So it's a very, very simplified version. It's just painting onto one screen in one color, but they can switch the colors um, in the code and then code different ways like that. So that's kind of my recommendation for that. Um, if they're having a lot of trouble, uh, one of the best ways is to get them with that coach and starting to kind of talk to them because the coach will often have really good recommendations and help them with any of the kind of problems that they're having in their coding. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Hi, Kali. Uh, it's Jama here. Hi. Hi. Um, so I just had a question on terms of the time zone. So I'm based in London, UK. So uh, that's roughly around 8 p.m. Uh, UK time. Is yeah. there, I'm not sure what the demand is like, but is there any opportunity of having a two, two webinars or based on time zones? I'm not sure how many people are in my time zone at the moment. But. So right now, we're just going to be doing the one webinar at three um, okay. in standard time, but your student will also have the 15 minutes with a one-on-one -on -one coach a week and also the one hour of coding time with a group. So it's not like they're kind of losing all of their coding opportunities with a coach but they're going to have additional opportunities um, in those respects. Does that make sense? Yeah, and what would, so this, the webinar is the three to four Eastern. Yeah. Then there's a, there's a group one. What time is that roughly? Is there... So the group one will be dictated based on your availability or the student okay. availability. So you'll pick a time and then a group of four to five students will all be put together in a group and start coding together. So that's all based on the availability of the student and the parent. So that will be guaranteed to fit with your time. Cool. Mm -hmm. And the one-to-one -one is agreement between the coach and the student and the parents. Okay. Perfect. Great, um, thank you. General thing, all of the webinars are recorded and they're put on YouTube. So there's a lot of um, content already up there. The only thing is you can't be as interactive with a, um, with a recording compared to doing it live. A lot of students like to kind of call out and have a back and forth with the person in the webinar. But that's something I will bring to the, the CEO of the company and see if we can move forward potentially with doing a later webinar, okay? Cool, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and there is a message in the chat. So the initial sign up was from July 27th to the 20, September 27th. So the webinars are always happening. So the webinars started way, way back and they're just always occurring from three to four, a Monday to Friday, regardless of anything. Again, I will make sure that the, um, the link is sent out to all parents so that you can access the webinar. Again, the Thursday is more for an introduction session, but students are allowed to join regardless of their level. It just may be a little bit hard to understand some of the higher concepts on the other days. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Brad. And uh, I think I already answered Zena's question regarding the London Time webinar. I will bring this up to the CEO, but currently we're just offering three to four. Hey, Kyla, uh, this is Nizar, um, Basil's dad. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, missed it, but uh, shall we expect emails to be sent out for the July 27th start, or is it uh, kind of like everyone can start on their own? So you can start coding right now. So as soon as you get your login, you can start coding and your child can start moving forward and progressing in the platform. Um, you'll get an email regarding your one-on-ones. Uh, I will send the link of the webinar in an email. Sorry, I just got another chat. Um, but all of the, the information that you'll need regarding signing up for your one-on-ones and your team meetings will be sent in an email to you. Cool, thank you. Perfect. Hi, this is Zalyn. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I have two, actually I have three daughters signed up for this. Mm -hmm. uh, two are actually doing it and the third one's kind of 
not so interested. <laughs> uh, so will I get an email invite for each of them or, or is it just one for me or will, or how does that work with multiple children? So what's likely going to happen is I'm assuming you want them all to be in the same team, correct? Oh, well, the, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> they said they didn't want to be with anyone else, but I'm like, kind of meet other people so they'll all likely be on the same team so there's going to be one team link for them but each one will have their own one-on-one -on -one session with a coach okay so okay. each one will get their own kind of link that they will log into and start the meeting like we're having here for 15 minutes um, for a student that's uninterested one of the best things again to do is what might be fun is you got you got three of them doing it you can tell them to do group projects there's lots of fun group projects that they can do in addition to the dragon quest ones or the ones that are kind of focused in the team event and you can get them all to work together on something like you know make an animal like see if they can work together that's always really fun um i, I am a teacher so i always like to to kind of push people in that way um but using your other children to help motivate the one that may not be as interested and in getting them to do some team coding together outside of their regular team coding sessions might be fun um, or just you know having a little friendly competition and seeing if they can do some of the projects that are really cool or getting them to show off the coolest project that they've done um, you can even do like a weekly thing where each one of your kids shows you or all of them the the coolest project that they've made for the week that might be a good motivational factor true um they they are quite old so they're grade 10 Okay. 11 and 12 so two of them have done uh the c plus plus grade 11 course yeah so the, and, and the one that's not really interested is the one that's going into education so she's uh, going to university <laughs> so anyways uh they're a little bit more advanced at this point and but so I what I recommend is I, I was thinking younger like you know seven to thirteen so with older kids, I have a much different approach, and that is to get them to do more projects and really focus on the coach telling them what to do. Because once they're in that meeting with a coach, they'll be able to push them really hard and be able okay. to them to kind of see all of the things that they can develop and to bring kind of to their coding. Coaches will also help um, kind of build the higher level skills, even in you know a high school grade 12 course, a lot of the time, kids don't necessarily understand some of the higher level concepts and that's something that the coach would help facilitate with. Okay, uh, it's too bad they left the room before you answered this question <laughs> because they're like, yay, we don't have to go to the webinar. Um, all right, that would be good, thanks. <laughs> if you have any other questions or um, especially regarding their, their team meetings, it'd be really good to, um, talk with the coach because the coach can also kind of work with them if they're a little bit older and put them in a kind of harder stream of what they're doing right it's all individualized and we can coordinate what the students are learning to their actual learning needs and their ability right okay and yeah and it's interesting this is a actually a very good form because we found in our high school that because they're female um there was some challenges in terms of their knowledge level compared to other students coming in and not having any formal the formal work or anything before this. So I like this approach where it's very individual. Yeah, it, it really helps make sure that, you know, kids as young as six, again, all the way up to kids that are 18. Like we've got a 16 year old who's coding with us right now and he's doing absolutely amazing and he does absolutely everything and he's, completely changed the way that he's coded from almost knowing nothing to basically being fluent in object-oriented programming and really being creative with his coding, which is another thing that isn't taught really in schools, even mm -hmm. um, until kind of the very high levels, is how to create something with a goal in mind and then being able to creatively figure out how to do that, right? Yep. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. You're very welcome. Hi, Kayla. Uh, this is Alice. I have a question. When you uh, reform the students into the group, what are the considerations? Like just the availability or like an age or their preference or their competency with the skill or? 
Yes. So generally what we've been trying to do is focus on age, time, and um, their skill level all together. Obviously, that doesn't always work out, but we try our best to make the best teams possible. But generally, centrally, we focus on availability and then go to age and skill level. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions, but if not, I'm going to end the webinar here. So I'll give you guys another minute uh, till 1245 and then I'm going to be signing off. Thank you so much for attending and hopefully this was uh, informative and helped you understand how CAT Hatch works. Thank you, Carol. Perfect. And just to let you know, all of this will be sent in an email, including the webinar. Okay. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day, okay? Thank you. Thank you.